Ladies and gentlemen, people of all gender expressions, thank you for checking out the North Bank Media Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Strevens. Joining me on the show this morning was Brittany Contessa. She is the founder, owner, operator of a business, a brand called Femme Powered, operating in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, you know she stresses that her background, while it is in psychology, she is not per se a uh, practicing therapist. Um, but in that way, she offers her own brand of, of therapy or of, of counseling, um, of providing a space for people of all ages, all genders, but uh, specifically young women and young girls, I think, a uh, space for them to engage, uh, to be heard, just to just to get it out, you know, the trials and tribulations that, that we go through at that age. Um you know, so often those relationships are fraught, you know, whether it's with the parents, the teachers, uh, the guidance counselors, and, and Brittany can sort of be a, an, an outside third party perspective. And uh, she finds a lot of success with uh, empowering and just listening, uh, listening to these to these people. Um, and of course, as we like to do on this show, we move down the road past some sort of interesting social topics into uh, how Brittany's life that she's lived and, and in, in 30, 30 odd years, you know, she's encountered some devastating, really devastating um, moments, uh, moments that would knock a lot of us to the ground uh, for good. Uh, but she's found a way to rise up to sort of completely fall apart and rebuild and now is offering an authentic version of herself uh, to the world. And I, I couldn't be more pleased to find yet another guest who was willing to speak very frankly on how um, their struggles and their journey have allowed them to become who they are. So, um, you know, beyond that, uh, we, we touched on, we kind of walked the tightrope on a few social, uh, larger political social issues at the end. But I think the meat of this episode, what I'm most proud of was, was, was how she was able to share so clearly um, the journey that she went on to becoming herself and how the work that she's doing uh, is a, almost a one-to-one representation. Although... As we all are, she admits the brand is shifting and the person is continuing to grow. So uh, one I enjoyed, one I really enjoyed going back through and and clipping up some content for the Instagram and kind of reliving the conversation. So on that note, please, please check out the Instagram at North Bank Media Podcast for for some clips from this episode and past episodes. But in the meantime, enjoy this one, the full-length conversation with the lovely Brittany Contessa. All right. Well, Brittany Contessa, thank you so much for coming on to the North Bank Media Podcast. It's great to see you. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing a bit about your life and your your brand and your business. Thank you for having me. So I guess just for, for the listeners, I'm sure there's plenty of people who are listening who know you because you're going to share this with all your friends. But um, <laughs> what what is it that kind of in a, in a nutshell or in an elevator pitch, what is Fem Powered and what do you what do you see striving to do these days? So Fempowered is all about women's empowerment. So I work with, um, I have, I've actually started working with some younger girls now, like 10, 11 years old, but I, I work from, I guess, that age range, age sure. range all the way to whenever. Okay. <laughs> like I work sometimes with seniors, That's awesome. <laughs> um, more, more informal, um, but it's just really about building that empowerment and really helping these women to reach their goals. Cause we live in a society where it's getting better now, mm-hmm. but it hasn't always been so kind uh, to women and helping them achieve what they want to achieve. It's not been balanced or equal. Mm. Um, and then the other aspect of that is really some mental health support. So my background is actually in psychology, um, and more specifically working with youth. So a lot of my client base is youth, um, but really just trying to help them reach where they need to be and offering that support that is so lacking oftentimes. Interesting. Well, okay. That's good to know. So, and it comes in the form of, of like coaching, uh, sessions. Like what is, what is the actual service that you offer? Yeah. So, um, I book one hour sessions. Um, so I like to be full transparent. I am not a therapist and sometimes my youth that I work with will refer to me as that. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not a therapist. I need to be very blunt. (laughs) Yes. My background's in psychology, but I'm not master's level. However, my professional work experience is in youth work. So I am fully qualified to do what I'm doing. Um, (laughs) but I, I book one hour sessions, um, with whomever, whether Mm -hmm. they're adults or kids, um, we do have waiver for sign just to make sure that they do know that I'm not a licensed therapist and that, you know, this is what I'm able to do. And this is what I'm not able to do. Um, and then we, the first few sessions are usually spent goal creating, um, Mm. and going over background and really building that relationship because in any type of, um, mental health support or coaching, life coaching, whatever it is, you need to have that relationship. It won't work. Nothing will happen if you don't have that. Hmm. So I do one hour sessions, but I also do workshops. Okay. Uh, and that's more as of recently with COVID, 
restrictions lifting ish. <laughs> I've been able to have some right. in person stuff, which has been wonderful. That's awesome. And it's probably yeah. m- much better. I mean, you know, the, through the zoom, it's not so bad, but there's nothing like personal connection, right? Nothing like personal connection. And when I did the, I did a workshop for youth. It was about a month ago now. And it was just a, it's, it was a room full of girls ages. We'll say 11 to 16. Okay. And it was amazing. Like the energy in the room was amazing. You could tell, you know, they were nervous to be there, but once the opening was given to them to actually like just talk and just be part of a community, it was like word salad, like boom, (laughs) (laughs) everything came out and it was so therapeutic. It was so lovely. That's awesome. Yeah. There's nothing like that. And it's, it's a shame that we kind of got screwed out of that over the last couple of years, but I'm I'm glad you're getting back into that. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Right, because it's relieving for you, right? As someone who's facilitating the discussion, helping these people, that obviously feeds back to you. It does. And it's really hard, you know, when you're in the middle of a very deep conversation, you know, it, they get emotional. You right. know, I'm working with people who have had lots of trauma in their life, mm-hmm. um, you know, myself included. And so I'll be sharing, they'll be sharing, right. and all of a sudden the internet will cut out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, how do you... What like nothing ruins, right. <laughs> nothing ruins a deep conversation when you're frozen on a screen and you look stupid. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> you know? I've so, been yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. So, so that's wonderful then that the in-person stuff is happening. Are you, I guess I'm curious. So it's, it's mostly youth then you're saying, so girls between 11 and, and 16, is that, is that the majority of your clientele? Yeah, that, that would be the majority. I would say the average age is about 14. Okay. Um, but though I have clients in their 40s, I have clients in their 30s, um, I have a few in their 20s. And then I'm actually, the the influx recently has been a lot of parents reaching out to me with girls who are 11 years old. Yeah. And from what I gather, the thinking is, you know, they're heading into junior high come September and uh, these parents need like a little bit of extra support um, before junior high just to just to start training their mind already to just be themselves, not to fall into bad ways, not to fall in with the wrong people to try to fit in and right. just to gather that confidence. Interesting. So is it, is it the parents usually coming to you or do these kids have a sense that like, I need help? Actually. Okay. So for the younger ones, it's the parents and it's okay. usually because, you know, the kids don't really, um, it's not that they don't have a voice. They're just not sure how to use it yet. Right. Um, but for the youth, a lot of them have said, like, I want to talk to somebody. And a lot of them are not comfortable talking to a registered psychologist or a psychiatrist or they're, they're just not comfortable. And so my goal has really been to build a relationship where I'm not um, an authoritative figure. I'm not. Right. Know this super educated, like I am educated, but I'm not like this. <laughs> not too educated. Yeah. Yeah. Person. I don't ever want them to feel like they're being analyzed in any way because they're not. I, my goal is just to really make them feel heard and like a human being. Wonderful. So, um, a lot of my referrals are word of mouth. Parents of okay. have friends and they say, you know what, if you need support for your daughter, my girl went and saw Brittany and, you know, the, the outcome has been really good. Mm. So yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. Okay. Well, and for what it's worth, I'm not that well educated either. If that's not obvious already, but (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I think you're quite well spoken and you know what, that's another thing like education. I'm, I'm a book nerd. Like I loved, I loved school. I was an honor student. I went to university. Um, I, I love education. I love learning, but I don't think that learning takes place only in a classroom. I don't think it takes place sitting at a desk with a textbook. And I'm really, we can get into that later, but I'm really oh, sure. I, I, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. It's true. I mean, so much of learning has to come through doing right. And, and failing it publicly, almost failing at the thing so that you can <laughs> learn how to do the thing. Right. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another thing too, you know, when I first started from powered more, so when I started working with clients, I had like major imposter syndrome because okay. they said who am I to be do- right. doing this like, I know I'm not saying that I'm something that I'm not you know I'm not like saying oh well I'm a therapist right. because I choose to be like <laughs> you know <laughs> right. I'm very transparent in that way um but I did feel that because I didn't have that like master's level certificate mm. on my wall but I was less than you know all these other people and I had a mentor of mine who actually was my school counselor in junior high okay She's a mentor of mine still to this day. And she said, you're exactly the person to be doing this. <laughs> like, don't, don't discredit your skills. You Maybe you can't, you know, be paid as a therapist or call yourself a therapist, but you sure. are providing therapeutic 
um, sessions for these people in it, in its own way. Right. So that was very helpful to hear. <laughs> right. Well, I, I kind of was taking a look through your, through your page and I thought that was kind of ingenious or inventive on your part that like, okay, so you're not certified to, to, to be like a clinical psychologist or whatever, a practicing therapist, but you've branded it in such a way where it's like, I'm not that, but this is what I can do. And it, it's, exactly. I'm sure it's just as helpful. I mean, I spent a lot of money on a psychologist once upon a time and it wasn't always helpful. Here's what I've learned. I have been in therapy myself. Uh, my life, in my life, I have been through the ringer. I have experienced intense trauma and grief and all sorts of things. And I've, I've sat with many uh, therapists who, are, who have been wonderful people. Right. Um, but I also sat with people who weren't therapists. Mm who were wonderful people and all they needed to do was just open their ears and listen. Mm -hmm. And that to me was what I needed. And so I don't discredit therapy. I don't discredit methods. I know that these methods that have been developed for decades, you know, specific types of therapies and um, clinician ways, I know that they're merited Mm -hmm. in certain circumstances, Uh, but for a lot of these kids, they just need an ear. They don't need to sit down and be given a specific scientific psychological method (laughs) they just need somebody to listen Mm -hmm. and say i hear you right gotcha and and what is it why why is what is the reason that they can't get that from the parents is it just like the parent child bond is just one way and they some, some things can't be spoken or or what is it that you do that the parent i guess can't do do you have children? No, and we're going to go there too. But <laughs> yeah, what a stupid question that maybe was. But no, I'm, no, and the reason I ask is okay, so I have two kids, um, and they're young, they're four and three. But um, I know that there will be a time when my daughter reaches an age where she can't come to me with everything, not because I don't want her to, but because she just isn't comfortable. There comes a point in a young girl's life where they're really, well, in a young boy as well, I just can't speak from that perspective, sure. but where you, you are really striving for that independence and you want to be your own person. And then, and sure. part of that is having things that you just don't feel like sharing with your parents. Mm. And as a young woman, I I was the same with my mom. Um, I used to tell her everything. And then all of a sudden overnight, it was like, I just I don't want to bring this to my mom because she's too attached to me. She's Mm. too emotional. She loves me too much. Her view is biased. It's not. So for these parents, especially during COVID, who've literally been trying to do it all and trying to, you know, work from home and then having their kids home every other week because they have a running nose and, you know, all these things, trying to like pay the bills, losing jobs, trying to provide mental health support for their kids. Mm -hmm. They need help. So I'm helping the parents as much as I'm helping the kids. I'm the one being like, you know what? Let me take some of that load for you. We can do it together as a team. Because honestly, it's cliche, but it's true. It truly takes a village. It does. Yes. And in COVID, a lot of parents lost their village. Huh. And it was very, and I did too. Right, <laughs> so right. There was a point where I'm like, holy hell. <laughs> like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> Could, I want to just press you a bit because I, I, I figured, I didn't figure, but I, it makes sense what you're saying. What are some of the things then like that these young girls come to you you know, just as an example, can you drill down on maybe specifically some of the issues then? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I deal with every, like it's a whole spectrum of issues. So I'm dealing with more severe issues like okay. eating disorders oh, okay. and, um, self-harm, which in those cases, the parents are aware. Right. So in okay. those cases, the parents came to me because their child reached out to them saying like, I'm struggling in this way and I need to talk to somebody. And in those cases, a lot of them are also seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist, Mm. but they just, that, that was more for, um, just to check if there were any like mental health disorders or anything deeper like that. Cause obviously I can't diagnose anything. Um, and then they wanted someone extra just to do some more talk therapy and, and to help goal plan for school, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm dealing with more issues like that, but then I'm also dealing with just like the typical, you know, school is really hard and I have no idea who I am Mm -hmm. and please help me figure it out. (laughs) You know, cause yeah, junior high can suck. (laughs) Junior thinking about it now, like the leap, to junior high is it's almost disproportionately the a bigger leap yeah. than you really take certainly to that point but even after maybe right like that's a huge jump and Just, it's brutal and it is brutal um, 
kids can be mean and just knowing from experience girls especially can be really mean it's in a much different way it's um it can be very manipulative it can be very harsh Mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to pick on girls I'm really not but I've experienced this (laughs) firsthand and every woman every mother I've ever talked to every every woman who's gone through junior high has said the exact same thing girls are mean (laughs) and 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 they can they can be and part of that it's a that's a whole other other day possibly of conversation but (laughs) right society in a lot of ways has kind of set it up that way um it's instead of collaboration it's a lot of competition Hmm. Um, and that's kind of one of my other missions behind Fem Powered. And, and it says right on my website, like, imagine what we could achieve if we work together instead of against each other. Well, exactly you know? right. Exactly <laughs> that, right. That's not just women. That's men. That's that's human beings across the board. Mm-hmm. So a lot there before we fly down that road, which I appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate everything you're saying. You're, you're right, though, because my memories of junior high, I remember maybe I remember a guy comes up and pinches your nipple or he slaps you on the back of the head or whatever. Like it's like that real physical <laughs> bullying, but it was like, whatever that didn't. And then it's done. And then it's know? done. It didn't, it was like he asserted what he had to assert and it didn't bother me for too long. No. And it, it was done and you, you didn't go home and wonder all night why he pinched your nipple. Right. <laughs> you were right. just like, well, it happened and now I'm going to go have dinner. Like, exactly. Right. Maybe yeah. I enjoyed it even. No, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> like could have been, maybe, maybe, right? maybe or it was just funny. Right. But, right. But, but words hurt. And, you yeah. know, when I'm hearing these 13, 14 year old girls calling each other, the things that they're calling each other and saying these things, I'm like, do you understand that the world is already possibly going to be cruel towards you? And these names will be will be flying around anyway. So why are you doing it to each other? Right. Like, let's let's try to fight this. Um, let's try to fight this stigma and these gender differences. And like, why are you doing this? Well, <laughs> so let me ask deep. you. Let me ask you that then. Like how much of this is projection on like you have a girl who's a bully. How much of that is coming from a place of like self hate or she's being bullied by her older sister or whatever. Like where did, where does this come from? I'd say like almost a hundred percent of right. it. Right? So it's like that phrase hurt people, hurt people. Sure. Um, it's very rare that, well, I shouldn't say it's very rare, but it's, it's not often that a person just is like, I'm going to be a bully. Right. You know, right. it's usually like happy people, people that are feel supported and safe and loved. They don't just go out and hurt people just for the heck of it. Right. Now, listen, there are there are disorders where, yes, people are sociopaths and sure. they truly don't care. They could have the most loving, uh, supportive home and they just don't care. But that's a totally different thing. Right. Yeah. The girls that I'm working with, um, when they are being bullied, I ask them a little bit, you know, do you know anything about your bully? Do you know anything about their personal life? And most of the time it's like, yeah, she has um, a mother who's not around. She has a dad who's addicted to drugs. She has no, like, there's always a very similar story Mm -hmm. of home not being a very safe place. Uh And then, you know, they take that to school and they exert control where they can because they don't have any control at home. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, instead of, controlling in a good way like you know controlling their studies or controlling you know their extracurriculars where I'm like you know what I don't have control at home but I have control at school so I'm going to join a team and I'm gonna you know they they harness that in a negative way (laughs) aka bullying sure and is this a is this a tale as old as time or are we seeing a sort of uptick in this kind of behavior among girls it's a tale as old as time (laughs) Because even like the moms that I, the moms of the kids, you know, they're in their forties. Um, some of them are in their fifties and they're like, oh, I was hoping this would be done by now. <laughs> I've talked to my grandma who's 83 and it was a thing when she was a teenager. Right. You know, like I wouldn't say it's gotten worse. I would say there are different avenues for it now. Social media, mm-hmm. pick on social media. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the big difference even from when I was in junior high school until now there was no social media when I was in junior high right now there is and the cyber bullying is to the nth degree I can only imagine yeah I can only imagine I have no experience in it I don't have kids and I'm aged out of it I guess but what are there things that you so then when you reveal to those kids let's say for instance like even just putting one and one together like this girl has a shitty life and so she takes it out on you does that help to soothe or is or does it because the attacks are still ongoing? It's not enough. It's no saying that is not enough. I mean, you can provide the information. You could you could provide the facts, but at the end of the day, these girls are like, yeah, I get that. So they have a bad life, but why are they taking it out on me, right? Right. 
part of that, like I'm, I'm going to be 32 right away. And I, as an adult, who's a mother, who's had life experience, I can look at someone who's not treating me proper and, and, and separate it and say, you know what, I don't have time for this. I'm just going to ignore that and not let it bother me. And I don't, but for these girls whose brains are literally not yet developed (laughs) to the full extent, they focus on it and they fix it. And although they may know it to be true, they may know, okay, this girl who's treating me terrible has a terrible home life. They might know that, but they don't put the connection together and they're not, they're not in a place emotionally where they can separate it. Mm -hmm. And so they do take it personal and I don't blame them. I did too. Right. Oh yeah. (laughs) But these sessions that I do with them, a lot of times it's just for them to have that weekly or bi-weekly reminder that they're actually not the problem that the problem is external from them. And it's just that reminder drilling it in their head so that one day when their brain is fully developed and they can compartmentalize um, that hopefully they have the skills to do that. And so that's another part of what I do is I try to get them geared up for the future. Sure. (laughs) Mentally, you know, we can't control everything, but we can, um, we can figure out how to shift our perspectives and live, Mm -hmm. you know, a healthy life without being bothered by absolutely everything. Because that happens too. <laughs> well, certainly it does. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea lately of like, well, I don't know what you want to call it, but when these girls are bullied, for instance, using this example, that that negative energy, those words, that that self-image mutilation, whatever, goes inside of, of them, right? Yeah. What, what, what sort of symptoms are you seeing then? Like eating disorders is one, I guess, or whatever. How does it come, like how does that then feed back into the way they look at their world? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's so honestly, it's so complicated. Um, I have girls that I work with that literally don't care. They're like, meh, they, you know, they're not nice to me, but I don't care. Mm. And they move on and they're okay with that. Um, But then I have other girls and a lot of them, a lot of the girls I work with are struggling with generalized anxiety. They've either been been diagnosed by a professional um, or I'm just picking up on, you know, they very clearly are struggling with anxiety. I can't diagnose, but I can see this clearly. Sure. Um, and so that's how it manifests. They get told things over and over and over again, negative things about themselves, say by a bully, things that are not even obviously true. Right. And then they sit with that at 10 PM, 11 PM at 1 AM. They're still thinking of like how, you know, say, say they were like, Oh, you're a piece of shit. So they go home and they think, okay, I'm a piece of shit. Why did they call me that? Well, I don't think I'm that. Well, what if I am that? And then it like, they spiral. And then it comes out with them, you know, yeah, the eating disorders and like, well, maybe if I lost a little bit of weight, I wouldn't be such a terrible person. Or maybe, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe the guy that I have a crush on or the girl that I have a crush on would like me or it comes out in so many ways and it's very individual, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, like I said, I've seen it come out as self-harm. I've seen it come out as eating disorders. I've seen it come out as kids just simply dreading. And I don't mean like not wanting to go to school. I mean, dreading going to school, Wow. like depression, like very, very severe things. And, and things that, that you'd almost say they're too young to have to deal with that in some yes. ways, right? Cause the brain, like you said, the brain isn't fully developed and it's being, so can this stuff get to the point where it affects development? If it's not dealt with, I'm going to say, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. And I'm going to, so I'm going to give you an example. Um, I don't know if I want, well, it's per, it's not, well, it's personal, not about me. It's about my brother. Mm. So I, I'll just do it. Sure. And if, yeah. So my brother, um, my brother was abused by his dad. We okay. have different dads. My oh. brother was abused by his dad um, when he was, young, very young. And my mom left him and, you know, got him out of the situation, but the damage was kind of done and he never dealt with it. He never, he never dealt with it. You know, my mom tried to do what she could and get him the help and whatever, but he was, he just wouldn't, you know, you can't force a kid to talk. You just can't. Okay. Um, and especially, you know, he was a young man, you suck it up, you don't cry, you get, you move on with it. Like his dad had said all these, all these things to him. And as the abuser, you know, he held control. And then my brother was like, well, I'll be less of a man if I, and I, I'm putting words in his mouth, but this is kind of what I think happened. Okay. Regardless, he never dealt with any of it. And then, yeah, it did, it did greatly affect his future and it, it affected all the choices he made from that point on. Um, because when you, when you have that kind of damage done and you don't 
deal with it in any way, whether that be talk therapy or medication if needed, you right. know, if you clinically need it, or it just festers. And then suddenly every choice you make, every everything you, every decision you have to make, every big choice is affected by this negativity and this trauma. Mm. So rather than all your choices having a foundation of like logic and empathy and understanding where you're rational, it's all reactive uh. and it's based on hurt and anger and um and relationships right like how can you have a healthy relationship if on the inside you are completely a mess you can't (laughs) (laughs) not a healthy one anyways (laughs) yeah so yeah so to answer your question i believe yes that if you don't deal with these things it will fester throughout your whole life in different ways right no i appreciate i know that's a very personal example for you i read a little bit on your blog about your brother um yeah yeah, I, I mean, how could it not, right? Like, I don't know if this, because I'm, I'm talking about something on a spiritual level almost. Like, t- t- to draw a different example, I went over to my parents the other day and they were watching CNN and just all this mm-hmm. coverage of what's going on in Ukraine. And yeah. I, I'm not tuned into that right now. I just refuse to... to, to I mean, you both, you know, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> there's no need for, after two years of caring way too much about what was going on, I just said for this one, I get it. Someday maybe there's, it's going to happen in my backyard and f- stupid me for not paying attention. But right now I'm not. And But I said to my dad, well, I didn't say this. I should have said it. All that <laughs> all that is going inside you, yeah. right? All those images, all those words, all that, everything goes inside you and has to go somewhere, surely. Yep. Does that seem... You're, does you're that, so uh, correct. <laughs> right? Like, And so then to keep it going, I guess I would say like, is... is uh, are we looking at an epidemic for children with social media and this st- this constant stream of content and this constant stream of, I guess, being exposed to other people's ideas, where then it it it, it fucks up to use a pretty lame word, but it it, it ruins the self development and the concept of the self. Yep, ops, a hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because even me, like at the beginning of the pandemic, um, like. Well, maybe not the very beginning. We'll say, when did it hit here? March, 2020? Yes. So by, I would say by the end of April, I was so freaking COVIDed out. I was tapped out of people fighting online. And that was only in the first month of it, right? It got worse and worse and worse. I was completely tapped out. I was so sick of seeing people fighting online with absolutely no education base evidence based nothing it was at some point every, sure. everybody was just yelling if, if if it's possible to do that on a computer and it is like because you can hear the tone as you're reading it yeah and i completely checked out and i've said many times that if my if small business wasn't so reliant on social media these days for marketing platforms i would not be on it at all my personal social media accounts are not used yeah. <laughs> like i i I post once a year now on my personal stuff. Why? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, really. Why? I don't know. But yeah, it's, and so, but I'm, I'm of an age and I'm, I've, my brain is there where I can say, I can see that this is impacting me negatively. And I can see that I am addicted to scrolling and uh, what I'm scrolling through is negative, 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 death, 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 death. You can only suck that in so much before you snap. And finally one day I did. And I just, I started unfollowing all these accounts. And now all that's on my feed is like babies and <laughs> Donuts. Like good, yeah. I follow a good deed page where it's like all good news. Oh, cool. And, um, and I, I haven't watched the news. I don't actually remember the last time. Nice. But these kids don't get that right. They're addicted to the scrolling. They're addicted yeah. to the TikTok, and they're addicted to, uh, like Snapchat is huge right now. It's not even okay. necessarily like a Facebook, Instagram for them. It's like Snapchat, TikTok. Mm. Uh, and it's the bane of my existence <laughs> in what I do because I'm sure. like, I have an answer. Log out. <laughs> log out. But then you, you log out and you're I – rem- I remember being young myself and we all my friends would play on the front street and you'd have to go in for bed and you, you'd look out the window and still see the kids playing out front. It's it's that same thing. It's like they could never yeah. imagine logging out. FOMO, right? Like just you FOMO. don't want to miss out. Right. You might miss something big, right? Well, you might miss – yeah, so, so that's interesting what you said there, the bane of your existence. Yeah. So because, you, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say like, do you ever get through to these kids? I mean, I, I, I'm sure they can on some level rationally understand. Yes. TikTok is bad for me. Yes. This girl has a bad life. So she's taking it out on me. But like you say, they can't 
act in a way to, to re-correct or to correct course? No. And, and yeah, so it's like, it's like going up to a smoker and giving them a pamphlet and being like, do you know that smoking can kill you? Yeah, no shit. Yeah. They know that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They're like, well, thank you for the information. Right. It's just information, right? So I can mm-hmm. provide the information, ah. but at the end of the day, they know this, they know that there's a bunch of garbage on social media. They know that a lot of their bullying is coming from social media, but do you think they'll be like, Oh, I'm being bullied on here. I'm going to log out. No, <laughs> so you want to stay in the fight almost, right? Exactly. Right. And it is an addiction, right? And that's, mm. I mean, there's so many studies that have proven that it's an addiction for kids, adults, anybody, right? It's, yeah. This is, this isn't news. Um, but then on the flip side, you have parents that are like, okay, I'm going to control their phones and control their social media. And so then they take their phones away at evening or whatever it may be um, and start even scrolling through their stuff to make sure there's no like bad things going on. Right. And then that, that creates another problem in itself because nowadays, and uh, um, I'll pick on young girls again, or anyone who uses a journal, Sure, social media is very much now like a journal. It's the equivalent of, you know, getting your journal out with a pen and sure. saying, you know, do your diary today, I feel like crap. Right. Mm-hmm. So they go on there, they'll write a post or they'll share a video or whatever. And that's, that's their outlet now. Mm. So it's really to try to find that balance. And I will be fully honest. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the balance is because <laughs> I'm not them, right? Well, you said something interesting and that was something that my psychologist said to me years ago. He's like, I cannot tell you what to do, you know? No. And that's, in some ways you must feel powerless, but in some ways you're also ultimately privileged because you can really just allow them to talk themselves into where they need to be. Is that right? Well, or, or Well, that's absolutely right. And I mean, your psychologist probably said like, he or she can't give you the answers. You have the answers, but they can help guide you there. Right. And that's what any good talk therapy should be. That's whether it's from a therapist or a life coach or whomever, Mm -hmm. you can never give people the answers because your answers are not necessarily their answers. Right. So, um, I, I started my journey as a youth worker when I was, I was only 23. Oh, wow. And I was very naive. I, I had, yeah, I had a lot of life <laughs> experience and a lot of crap that had happened. Okay. And so I thought I was ready, but I went in with this attitude of like, I'm going to save the world and I'm going to save every kid I work with. Oh, okay. And I learned very quickly that that is not even a little bit possible. Um, and so now my mentality is I'm not here to be a fixer. I'm here to be a helper. Hmm. So. I can't fix your life, but I can help you in whatever way I'm able to. And so when my session with them ends after that hour, I debrief with myself. Mm -hmm. I put it to the back of my mind. I write my notes and I say, okay, I've helped with what I'm able to do today. Uh, Next session, we'll move on and see where they're at. Um, So no, you can't give answers. You just simply can't. And teenagers don't want to hear answers. Let's be serious. (laughs) (laughs) They don't, they don't want, want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> right. And well, and well, as we get older, we learn we should be suspicious of any these so-called gurus or anybody who who, yeah. who seeks to have the answers or who, yeah. who claims to have the answers, I should say. Yeah. And so, I'll say this. Uh, when I first, okay, I'll say like, this isn't really an accurate statistic, but it's my own that I'm making up in my head. <laughs> Based that's on what my, we love on this show. Inaccurate yeah, statistics. Yeah. <laughs> Throw it out there. No, I'll say like, 90% of the clients that I work with, mm-hmm. they, they didn't initially ask to see me. So they come into the first session, they're nervous because they're right. young and they're right. like, Oh, great. I have to speak to another counselor. My spiel literally goes something like this. Uh, I know you think I'm a counselor, but I'm not. And I know you think I'm going to try to tell you what to do. And I'm not. So are you good with that? Mm-hmm. And from there, the relationship blooms. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause it, you're not another, yeah. you're not another mom. You're not another teacher. You're not another yeah coach principal whatever it's like yeah well the the sad thing is too and it's this is again a whole other session for this but school counselors get a bad rap Mm. and i really wish they didn't but it's because that label has been applied to them right i wish they could just be called like a support person Mm. or like i don't know the school help or something (laughs) something. like as soon as they hear counselor they're like i'm going to be analyzed and shrunk and I'm going to, yeah, they don't want to talk to anybody who they feel like is judging them. Mm. They, and they don't, they're not old enough to understand that like therapists and counselors and mental health support, we're not judging at all. Right. It's yeah, we're not judging, but they think everybody's judging. Every person on the planet is judging them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's funny because judging is an interesting word because you as a, as a human with a brain have to order information in yeah. a way to make sense of it. Right. So you, 
Oh, you're not a, you're not applying a wow this kid is messed up but yeah. you, you are judging in some ways like I think I know where the problem is this is the road I want to take them down is that yes fair? yeah yes and I'm glad you say that because I've said it I've said it to kids before um that are like oh I think they're judging me and I'm like okay well let's let's walk through a day in your life and how you judge others because right? then <laughs> okay. whoa I don't judge I'm like no we we all do it every single day and it's not intentional right it's not intentional at all. It becomes intentional when you look at a person and you're like, I don't like what you're wearing today. You look stupid. <laughs> well, okay. That's an intentional judgment. But if you're you know, presenting in front of a class and you're looking around, you make a judgment of like, okay, nobody's actually listened to me, listening to me. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. I'll just read out loud because nobody's listening anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You've made a judgment. You've figured out that you're safe hmm. and you go from there. So I, we do talk about how judgment is absolutely necessary right um but not intentional to work it in a way of hurting others if that makes sense no for sure it's it's i guess it's the motive or it's the yeah the intent, the intent. everything's all about intent yeah i got you so now if somebody wants to you're finding it's more word of mouth but if somebody did want to get in touch with you and, and kind of let's say contract your services what's the best way to do that um, so a lot of people just will send me an email for more information, um, but they can just go to my website and all my info is on there. Mm -hmm. um, I do provide a free consultation and I, you know, the parent will say like, how long is the consult? And I'll say 20 to 30 minutes. And then we get on it and it's like an hour and a half later because <laughs> <laughs> we just get into really good conversation. And I want parents to be fully comfortable. They're putting, they're putting their kid in my hands for an hour, you know, virtually, but um, mental health is so fragile to begin with. And so you want to know that you're, you want to at least talk to the person who's going to supposedly be helping your kid. Right. For sure. So I, I like to provide that for them. Um, yeah. and I walk them through my methods. I walk them through my waiver. Um, you know, my limits to confidentiality, because although I'm not a licensed therapist, I still do follow the same confidentiality guidelines that okay. a therapist would. I do keep, um, like notes and, and whatnot. And there are limits of course, if, you know, sure. I thought their kid was in danger of some kind, I would have to let them know. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So just through my website is the easiest way. Okay. Awesome. I just wanted to get that out there because, you know, uh, well, like I said, I did see a tweet once and it's like, who knows who this person was, but they said, <laughs> they said, you know, I'm in the schools all the time and the kids are not okay. And I, I was inclined to like, in a way, believe that because of you know, I graduated in 2007, which was the year the iPhone came out. So I literally just missed all of this. But what if I, you know, what if we'd been 10 years younger than we were? Yeah, I know, right? I can't imagine it because it was bad enough as it was, <laughs> you know. No, like we, I remember, so you and I are roughly the same age then. Okay. Like I graduated in 08. So, mm. um, like I remember running home and hopping on my like Windows desktop <laughs> with like a computer this wide, right. logging on to MSN Messenger. Oh God, good times. And be and like we all did it. We would like rush home from school and then get on our computers and like <sighs> chat, right? And that was like the beginning of it. Facebook mm -hmm. didn't come around for me until about grade eleven. Okay. And nobody knew what it was. Right. You know, my sister in law and I had accounts, but I think she was my only friend because nobody knew about it and I didn't use it because I didn't know right? right it was like all my my space and whatever my right space. yeah my space oh my god yeah so it, I think I think being a teenager would have been a million percent different <laughs> if we had all that and I'm glad we didn't oh yeah I, 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 I am I'm very I yeah whatever the word is I'm glad as well that we didn't have to go through it like that no and don't get me wrong like it has its entertainment purposes. I mean, obviously we're doing this right now True, and, sure. and it's very helpful. And you know, there's cat videos and <laughs> <laughs> the internet can be a very funny place, but I think it's because we know how to use it. It came right. around when we already could like think about it logically, but yeah, it can be a scary place too. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you like thinking about maybe when you've had success with a kid that you sort of take them from point A to point B how much personal responsibility do you put on this kid? Like, as far as like, you know what? Yeah. You're getting it from all angles. Yeah. Life is tough, but also it's like, you know, and I hate to steal from Jordan Peterson cause he's, cause it's not his show and I'm not him and he's not me, but the idea of, of taking on responsibility and challenge and hard work does help 
anybody develop, right? So do you, is that part of your message for kids? I would, I would imagine it is, but what, how much yeah. does that play into like, yeah, yeah, sympathy, life's hard, but also you should be harder, so to speak. Yeah. So when you're working with kids, you have to be very careful with how you word it, but I always tell them, um, you know, I don't have sympathy for you. I have empathy for you Okay. and that I understand how hard this is because I, maybe I haven't gone through the exact same challenges, but I've gone through my own challenges and I've been to the point where I thought I was going to just <laughs> in lack of, well, I hope I'm not being dramatic. I thought I was just going to die. Like I was like, this is the end of me, right? This pain okay. is so insurmountable. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Right. So I mm. say I've been there. And so I have empathy for you. And I wish that this wasn't happening for you because mm. I never want to see anybody in pain but it is happening. So huh. what are we going to do about sure. it? Right. And so you just have to word it in a way that they know that you care, that you're not like, I'll oh, suck it up because there's enough adults in their life that are like, you know, just get over it. And, and they think, Oh, well, you're a teenager. What do you know? Like what problems could you possibly have? But they have a lot. They yeah. have a lot of, you know, I think of my own teenagehood. I had a lot of things that I was going through. And if someone would have said to me, like, suck it up, I would have felt like the most worthless piece of shit. <laughs> like, oh, well, why am I so weak if I can't even get over this? Right? right. You're not supposed to get over things. You're supposed to get through things. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, yeah. Yeah. You don't have to get over things. You just have to get through it. And it looks different for everybody. And that's kind of what I say. It's like, I can't, I can't get you over it, but I can help get you through it. So right. what, what are we going to do? What, what would work best for you? Do you like, what do you need? Cause there's not a lot of people in their lives. Oftentimes I'm not going to discredit all parents because parents want the best usually for their kids, but there's not a lot of people that will directly say, what do you need? Mm. What, or what do you need from me? How can I genuinely help you? And then they think about it and they're like, Oh, nobody's ever asked me that before. Yeah. And I'm like, well, nobody knows what you need more than you. Right. So, you know, they need somebody to acknowledge that they are human beings. They're not just like walking hormones. <laughs> yeah. There's that too, but for there's sure. That too. <laughs> yeah. With, with needs. Do you, is there a theme then or a, a recurring thing where they all say, well, what I really need is X, Y, Z. Like, what is that? Is there a thing that if we could just yeah. give them that might help? Yeah. It's, it is. The, I get the same answer most of the time and it's, I just need you to listen. Hmm. I just got to get it out. Yeah. Just let me get it out and don't, and don't um, judge me. Cause it's the thing about parents too. parents. And I am one. And I know that like, if my daughter or son get to a point where they need some extra support, I know that I can't be, I can't be it for them. I will help them find the additional support right. because I will immediately jump into fixer mode. We want to fix everything in our kids' lives. We want their life to be good. And mm. so it's like, okay, something's going on. How can we fix it? Right. And that's a lot of times where parents call me, they're like, I can't fix them. And I'm like, well, you're not supposed to, <laughs> I can't fix them. <laughs> you're not. And I, and I get that you want to, so now it's time for you to step away and mm. I will step away. Now, typically is that hard for a parent to accept that, that I can't fix them? Or is it like, I'm the factory. I, I'm, I sent them out into the world and warranty can deal with them. Or how does that go? I think it's, a, I think it's hard for them to swallow because, and I can't speak for every parent, but I know that a lot of parents want to be everything for their kids. Mm. And it's really hard when you want to be a certain way and then discover that you can't be. And that's with any aspect of life. You know, I really wanted to do this, but I'm realizing I can't. And that really sucks. Right. So I think it's hard for them to swallow that. Right. But once they let it go, you know, <laughs> at risk of sounding spiritual, once they let that go uh -huh. and accept the help, the help comes to them. Mm. And they find that their whole household kind of balances out a little bit better. They're not drowning, trying to do everything for their kid and their kids not drowning in emotions because they have an outlet. Right. And then they can focus on the parent child relationship rather than mom now being doctor, therapist, <laughs> like yeah. and, life and coach, bus survivor. Drug. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. We all, every single one of us needs help. Every one of us. Oh God. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. <laughs> I need, yeah, I need a lot of help. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of help. But I, yeah, we all do. I've had lots of help in my life. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's, I guess, is that sort of what, well, I guess I, ah, there's so much. I got to start making these episodes longer. I, I was doing two, three hours and it was just too much. But anyway. Yeah, no, it's all good. We'll try and get through a bunch of stuff still. I guess I was, you said something interesting that is, is typical. Not to say that you're typical, but uh, where you felt like you could just help everybody. And that's a very sort of, 
personality based, like, uh, you know, I don't want to say like the liberal savior, but you have that sort of savior yeah, complex, right? So absolutely, I do. Could you say a word or two on where that came from your upbringing? I imagine what was part of it. I think, I think with regards to savior complex, and I will, I will, I will admit a hundred percent. I do have that complex for sure. And it's something I have <laughs> to keep in mind. I always have to keep it right here and acknowledge mm. it, recognize when it's popping out in a, uh, in a detrimental way. Okay. Um, because listen, it would, the world would be a nice place if we all truly wanted to help each other. Right. Wow. But there's a difference between helping and saving, as I said, fixing and helping. Right. Gotcha. Um, yeah, my upbringing, I, listen, I was showered with love that was never lacking in my life, but yeah. I grew up in a house riddled with alcoholism okay. and craziness and my mom died young and my brother died young and like it's there's just been there's been a lot um and you know I moved from house to house like it, it was kind of crazy like looking back but I made it through it and so that's one of the huge reasons why I'm doing what I do now right um but that savior complex I think is there was that mentor I talked about in, in junior high, I honestly, I help, I hold her to such high esteem. And I honestly, I always say to people like she saved me hmm. and I wanted to be just like her. Mm-hmm. And, and she was one of the people later that said like, you can't, you can't save people. You can help them, but you can't save or fix them. Right. <laughs> and so my savior complex, I think is something that's just in me. When I was four years old, I told everyone I was going to be a doctor. Mm. I just, that's, and that, and then I was going to be a nurse. And then I was going to be a teacher. And so I've always gravitated towards roles where I was helping in some way. Hmm. But then if you have that savior complex, it's like, you're suddenly not just helping. Like you are the nurse who is literally saving the patient. Right. You're making (laughs) it. And unless you do that, you're not worthy. Uh, And obviously I don't believe that for anybody. Like that's not my belief, but for myself, my own expectations of me, that was, that was one thing I had to come to terms with. And I'm at terms with it now. I, you know, I'm happy with where I am and I'm happy with the help I provide, Mm -hmm. but that was hard to take at 23. Yeah. Yeah. I bet to have to admit to yourself that you, that you couldn't be that right. Like, but did it feel like failure at the time? Then you had to process that or. Yep. uh, (laughs) Okay. Wait a minute. Yep. I slipped into a depression. Um, I actually, so when I left my position, I was working in three or four inner city junior high schools. I was the, in the one school that I was at most of my time, I was the only support in the entire school, like mental health wise. And keep in mind, I wasn't even a psychologist. I wasn't like a registered therapist. I wasn't even a school counselor. I was a youth worker and I was the only person there. And so I was like, okay, I'm it. I've got this whole school under my belt. What am I going to do? I'm going to help all of them. Fine. Um, that war after a while. And then I started having some issues in my own family that were quite pressing, okay. um, that needed my attention. And, um, and then I got a case put on my desk at the school of, uh, well, I won't say what it was, but it was horrific. Okay. And I snapped. I went to the office. I dealt with it in the way I could. I went back to my office. I called my supervisor and I said, I can't do this anymore Mm. because I was getting to the point where I was, I was feeling like if I can't help all these kids and get them out of their situations, I'm worthless. I am not in the right career. I am not doing the right thing. I am not worthy of them. And I walked away and walking away was the hardest and best thing I ever did. Um, Because then I went and got a, a job because I had obviously bills to pay. I got a job that I could shut off at the end of the day. Nice. It really didn't mean a heck of a lot to me, but it, I enjoyed it. And and it, there was no heaviness to it at all. And, um, and yeah, I needed to do that. And uh, that's what helped me get out of my savior complex. <laughs> I had to be humbled. <laughs> ah, there it is. Well, that's, I appreciate you sharing that story with such candor, like, cause that's not easy to admit still, I'm sure in some ways. Right. But it is now. Cause I'm just like, man, this is life. <laughs> right, yeah. We're all going to like, people think of it as failing. You're not failing. You're like, I see it as transitioning. Honestly, you, you kind of fail in one area, but it's because you're about to transition to another. And that's kind of what life is all about. And right. yeah, I don't see failure. No, I think no, And so much of, well, it, Okay, so what that story you just told signaled to me a really important shift that 
I'm trying to make and that I hope other people make too in their lives where we get away from external uh, value sets, right? External forms of validation to you went to finally just said, I can't do this, but that doesn't mean that I can't do anything or I can't not do anything, right? Like, but the, the failure didn't come in some metaphysical way. The failure came internally. So if you didn't see it as a failure, then it wasn't a failure, right? That's now that's very freeing if we can get there. Yes. It's very liberating. And it's only recently that I've got to that spot. And it's not to say that, pardon me, I'm not going to beat myself up in other ways. We all do it. Sure. We are our own worst critics. That's mm-hmm. that's part of human nature, but it's acknowledging it and recognizing it and then doing something about it, right? Stepping back from yourself almost and like trying to see yourself from a third person view um, yep. because we, are, we think that we're doing nothing. And then others are like, whoa, what do you mean? Like you're doing everything. <laughs> And you're like, well, it was, I, you know, I'm just like the word just drives me nuts. And I've said this to ladies that I work with, like, don't say you just got a job at like some place, take the word just out of it. Like we are always trying to minimize what we do. We're trying to minimize ourselves and that's men included. That's everybody. Mm. And actually we're doing really great things. So don't use the word. Oh, I'm just, I'm just a youth worker. Well, what is that less than a therapist? Right. No. You are helping in the way that you're able to. And I think if the intention is to help others and create better lives for people, that's a pretty amazing intent. Mm-hmm. Don't <laughs> so. Well, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I'm just a, I'm just this, I'm just that. It's like, how about yeah. I'm just a living, breathing miracle that has no business being alive on this earth. Yeah, like how I are we am. here? Like that's a whole other podcast. How oh, are we yeah. here? Like these are the questions that I ask myself often, right. like often, right? But is there, I wonder, like, maybe it's for older people in your practice, not just the kids, but like, do you have to, like, if they're not religious, do you have to imbue them to, to breathe into them some sense of like, just how miraculous this life is? There's this existential dread or they're locked down on like this low vibrational shit. You know what I mean? Like, is that, there has to be that epiphany. You can't do it for them, but like any stories like that, where you've walked someone to a place of, I don't know, revelation. Yes. So I, I start off my sessions, especially with my adults, I, not so much with my youth, unless I kind of have an idea of the house that they've grown up in, like what their belief system is. Gotcha. Um, so first off, spirituality and religion are not the same thing. Um, no. Spirituality is just something anybody can have. And, and I, and I will say should have based on the fact that we're here, but some people just simply don't believe some people think we're molecules and that's all we are. And, Fine. That's I'm not still here. a religion or that's still a spiritual view, right? To believe that you, anyway, go on. I don't want to derail it. Right. Right. Please. But in a more spiritual sense, um, I have some adults that I've worked with and right off the bat, I'll say to them, just so you know, there may come a point where I come at this from a spiritual sense. Does that sit okay with you? Mm. And some will, some, well, actually most will say, you know what, to be honest, I've been thinking about this lately and it might be helpful to have somebody to discuss it with. Well, here I am, please. Yeah. Like I literally have <laughs> candles and crystals sitting Incredible. right here. Okay. Oh, you're real into it. <laughs> and like tourmaline to suck away the negative energy. Like, hey, does that work? Be honest with I me. I think so. Okay. It, hey, even if it's placebo, I think sure. so. Sure. If it sets the um, mood. Yeah. It, it helps me. It's very, it smells, everything smells nice and it's calming. <laughs> uh, hey, that's better um, than the alternative. Exactly. Yeah, no. So I'll say to my adults, like, how does that sit with you? And if it sits fine with them, um, I find points where we can kind of, piece it in. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did actually have one woman be like, I feel like I'm finally at a place of understanding why I'm here. And I I mean, it's not because of me, I might've helped guide them to open up their perspectives. Like, you know, I'm not going to force opinions on you, but they're not opinions. They're, they're ideas. And you take it with you and you sit with that and see how you, how it sits with you. Is it in your gut? Do you feel it to be true? Do you, Um, because I think a lot of, a lot of issues arise when you don't know why you're here and you have no, you feel you have no meaning or no purpose and you get to a really low place of what's the point. What's the point? What's the point? And this, this shift in me happened and I know we're running out of time. Nope. Um, It doesn't matter unless you have somewhere to go. I'm going to keep it going. (laughs) No, I have nowhere to go. (laughs) Oh, Oh, beautiful. Um, no. So when my mom died, I was just shy of 14 and it was her, like, well, her death was very peaceful. She died in her sleep, but I found her and, uh, it was very traumatizing, very 
very traumatizing. And six months before she died, my grandpa had died. Um, and he was my, I say he was the first man I ever loved. He was, I joke that, but it could be true that he was my soulmate. He was, my grandpa was everything to me. He mm. would, he, I can't even, I'm having a hard time talking. That's how much he meant to me. Mm -hmm. I'm getting emotional. Well, I appreciate you sharing. Um, that. So he passed <clears throat> and then my mom passed mm -hmm. and I was like just shy of 14. So I'm already heading into a point in my life where first off, I need a female role model <laughs> and I need my mother. My mom loved yeah. me. You know, she had her issues and, and our relationship was not like amazing, but it was a good relationship and I respected her and she loved me like no other. Mm -hmm. And I've never doubted that ever, but I got to a place of like, what the hell's the point? Everybody's just, we all just die. Like, why are we even here if we're just going to die? Like, what's the point? And so these are the thoughts at 13 that I was having. <laughs> thoughts that I never want my daughter to have to have, right? right? But that's when the shift in me happened. And I do, I don't wish that my mom was gone or that my grandfather was gone or that my brother died a couple of years ago. I don't wish any of that. But I know that all those little stepping stones had to fall into place in order to get me here. And it makes sense now. It never made sense at the time. I was just angry. But that's when I decided to start looking more into spirituality and looking more into um, astrology and just different, different things that like sure. people, you know, it's not part of school <laughs> yeah. to look like you're crazy, but I had always gravitated <laughs> towards yeah. zodiacs and stuff. Okay. As a kid, I saved my allowance. My first, one of the first books I bought was on astrological signs. My mom was like, what the hell? <laughs> but I was like, I want to be it. Yeah. I just... Yeah. So then I, I got to thinking, no, there has to be more. We, we aren't just here and then we die. Something happens in between and something happens after. Because hmm. there would be no point to us even being alive and having thoughts and feelings and personalities. There, there, like there would be no point to any of it. So that was my first thought. Now, I didn't actually put that into action until probably the last, well, my brother died. And then the rest yeah. fell into place. Um, but it, yeah, it's deep. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. I appreciate. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds to me like you moved again, you moved to a place of, you know, external meaning to a place of real deep internal truth and meaning. Like you found oh, meaning in yourself. Yes. yes. Okay. So that's what we were talking about. And so the, when I'm working with people, I, I can't force them to that place and I will never force right. belief systems onto them. But I so badly wish that they could come to these conclusions on their own, because once you find a sense of purpose, life is not so dreary and depressing. And, yeah. and listen, I, I would shoot myself in the foot. I am not saying that depression doesn't exist. Listen, sure. I know, I know that these are all clinical diagnoses and you can feel like maybe you have a purpose and still have depression. Like these things happen. But if you're just in a low mood and you're in a funk and you're just like, I feel so stuck and I can't move anywhere. Right. I want you to help. I want you to find that purpose. Cause once you do, it's like, it gives you the courage to take a step forward and be like, I have no idea what's going to come, but I just trust it'll come. <laughs> so Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or no, but no, you take the wheel, right? Like, isn't that it? Wouldn't you say? It is. You take the wheel, but then there's, but then that becomes a problem too. So then you have people that have to have 100% control of their life and everything in it. And we know as human beings that that is not possible. I see. I see. Right. So I say, yes, obviously you have the wheel too, but then at some point, like maybe let Jesus or whatever you believe in take mm. the wheel and you maybe do the brakes and the pedals. Right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I know just, what you're saying. You have to trust. You have yes. you have to let go of some control and just yes. go with what feels right. Don't just sit there and be like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait for something to happen. Right. But take everything in your life that's going on and try to try to make a little bit of sense sense to it. Because you know what? Um, even for me in the past bit, it's like I now understand why I was a youth worker at 23 and why it didn't work. And right. I understand why it's working for me now. Hmm. as opposed to then I understand why my brother passed when he did and why that lit a fire under me. I would have never understood that at 14. Impossible. <laughs> like ever. No. How could you? Well, yeah. It got me thinking about how you were saying like young girls, young people, their, their brains aren't fully developed and yet they're cast into this world with yes. undeveloped hardware, so to speak. And it's, it's, but it's the same as us as we're thrown to this chaos with just a human body and brain. It's like, good luck. Yes. 
Good luck. But yeah, then, may the odds be ever in your favor. Well, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> That's what they should say when you're born and slap you on the ass. But it's like, yeah. you know, it's but it's also like the most relieving and the most liberating moment for me was when I realized it's not anywhere else but inside. And if it's not inside of me, then I, I don't, I can't go looking for it. Nope. Oh, that is powerful. That's good. You know, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> hey, tell the kids, you know, spread the word. It's It's got to be, it's inside, I think. Well, I know. I mean, that's what I'm working with. So it's like when you say Jesus, take the wheel, it's like, it's to me, it's like, take that first step. And once you start rolling, momentum builds and something happens, something on a spiritual level happens when you go and the going gets easier. Yeah. So, yeah, and you're absolutely right. So even with Fem Howard, I, I came up with the idea on Father's Day 2019. And I know it was Father's Day because we had had a dinner. My son was three months old. And I decided on that day that when we got home from our family dinner, I was going to go for my first postpartum run. Now, you haven't had a child, but running after you've had a kid is very difficult. Okay. okay. <laughs> like that first run is like, uh, I'm going to be slower than shit rolling uphill, but I'm going to go for it. <laughs> Good to know. So I decided that day I was going to go for a run. And I was in the middle of a bit of an existential crisis. We had my son a lot sooner than I thought thought we like we conceived him quicker than I thought we would so my body hadn't even recovered from my first child and um I had never I never went back to work after I had my daughter because I just I just wasn't ready and we were at a place budget wise where you know we wouldn't be able to go on vacations and stuff but it was more important for me in my life to be home with my daughter gotcha but then I had my son and I was like I'm not like I wanted to be home with my kids for a bit, but now my son's three months old. I don't want to be home forever. Like, I don't, I don't want to be careerless. I always wanted a career. So how can I make this work? So I'm running and I'm like, okay, I, my passion was working with my my kids, like with the youth, right? Like I loved what I did. I just wasn't ready to do it. That wasn't the time, but I loved it. I was passionate about it. And I literally stopped in the middle of the sidewalk. (laughs) So embarrassing. I went, Eureka, (laughs) like out loud. And I was like, I'm going to start my own private youth work thing. I didn't even know what it was going to be. I'm like, and I'm going to go into schools and I'm going to run sessions in group form. And I'm going to do private things as well and uh, community workshops. And I'm going to call it Femme Powered. And then I ran home to tell my husband. That is literally how Femme Powered was born. So that was June 2019. Now, fast forward almost a year to like March, 2020, obviously I didn't know there'd be a pandemic. Um, I was, I was no, we're what September, 2019. I had got all my stuff together and I was just getting ready to start approaching schools and saying, this is what I'm doing. I'd like to come do some pro bono workshops just to get myself known and whatever, just as I was getting ready, COVID started rolling in Mm. and then I couldn't go anywhere because I, we, we weren't allowed. Right. And then my brother died like two weeks after that, un- completely unexpectedly. And I, that was my crumbling and resetting. I completely wow. crumbled to like a blank canvas. And, um, and I, I realized almost overnight why it hadn't been working. Why? Like I, I had my material ready, but my mindset, I just wasn't quite there something felt almost imposterish. Like it was, I just wasn't internally quite ready. I was like forcing it. Sure. Um, and then when my brother passed away, it was like, he said, I, I I'm a little, uh, I'm kind of witchy, woo, but I, I'm <laughs> able to connect with him. I know this sounds crazy. Um, but I actually had a dream and he said, go mm. your time is now. You don't have to worry about me anymore. He lived kind of a crazy life. I was always worried about him. He's like, you don't have to worry about me anymore. Now is your time. Wow. It, things are taking off now. So go with it. And it's like a fire lit in me. I can't even explain it. And here I am now. And that only could have happened because of that. I, I would have, I was always, a big part of me was always with my brother, wherever he was. Mm. And I couldn't focus on my wow. stuff at all. So it's like the crumbling. <laughs> like, but that. You have to do it. <laughs> But see, now that gives Femme Powered such a weight, like such a such an important meaning is like, think how much is behind that, right? Because it didn't exist without any of that it, loss. It didn't, no, it didn't. It was an idea and it was a good idea and it had the right intent. I wanted to help people truly, 
but I couldn't fully be present with my girls or in my groups because part of me was always with my brother. And I loved my brother more than anybody on this planet loved my brother, except maybe my mom. And, um, I, I did, I, that was the point in my life where I thought I was going to die. And he was like, no, you're not dying. You have to go freaking do something now. The, <laughs> like the you, opposite. You, have, you have a mission go. <laughs> it's like a rebirth, right? It, honestly, yes, that is the perfect word for it. Um, and, and I, I share that story with people and I, I, some people might think it's attention seeking or whatever, but it's not, I want people to know that you can completely fall apart and that doesn't have to be the end. That can actually be the beginning as corny as it sounds. I would almost say maybe Brittany that you have to fall apart. It adds substance. That's it, sure, for sure. it sure helps. Yeah. Maybe you don't have to fuck <laughs> can be kind of expensive, but I think you do. I honestly think you do. I'm trying, I'm searching my own life story and now it's not the time, but I I think there was a lot of the, you had to strip away everything and just really be humbled and really accept that like the weight of, in your case, truly the weight of your ancestors, the weight of your dead family is now uh, not on you, but it's, it's behind you. It's, it's their meaning is now in your work. Come on. Yeah. No, no, it is. And the other part, I you might have read it on my website, but I'm Métis as well. Yeah. And so um, I, and I will be honest, like, I don't know a ton about my heritage because all the people that could have taught me about it are deceased. Like most of my Indigenous sure. ancestors are deceased. It was, you know, my mom's side. So my mom's gone. My grandpa's gone. Obviously his mom is gone. Um, but my great grandmother was, you know, part of the residential school system and that carried Wait, I, I saw I saw it firsthand. I saw the generations that were impacted by it. Now, other families have been impacted a lot more. Right. Um, but like my great grandmother was completely ashamed of who she was and she did not raise her children in an indigenous way without the culture. Um, she married a Scottish man, my great grandfather, who was lovely. I remember both of them very well. And he loved the pants off her and they had a really good marriage. Um, but she would not raise her children indigenous, right? But if you look at a picture of my grandfather, you're like, okay, well, clearly, <laughs> like it's not, it's pretty evident, right? What our ancestry is. Um, my mom, same thing. Like my mom is identical to my grandpa, but then you look at me and I'm very fair and like, yeah. right? So, so people don't see that, but that's the thing. You don't know a person's story by looking at them. You look at me and you're like, oh, you're just like some Caucasian girl who, like you're making your way in the world because you know, it's pretty easy for you given the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. It might seem that way, but you actually have no idea of the ancestral things that have happened sure. in my life and the trauma and right. So you never know a person's story ever. No. Um, and trying, you're right. Like trying to undo all that lineage and create better for future generations of my, you know, even for me, my particular family, mm -hmm it's a weight. <laughs> it's well, like, yeah, it is. It's a lot. It is. It is. So, but I guess the idea there is that some of that weight won't get past your kids, right? Or you'll filter it in a way where it's like they can understand it rather yeah. than just have to unconsciously live with it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, I don't, I don't know. Well, I do know what happened with my mom. She married a monster, but um, like my grandparents, my grandma, and my grandpa were a, well, my grandma is my best friend in the world. Like she's, she's still living. She's my oh, number wow. one supporter. Um, and they were amazing parents. So loving my grandpa. Luckily he didn't carry any of these addictions or anything into raising his family. Um, so my, my, as far as I know, my mom, my uncle and my aunt had a very traditional upbringing hmm. with my grandparents. They were middle-class. My, my grandma was a nurse. My grandpa worked, um, his whole life as well. And they had just a loving family, but my, you know, some of my grandpa's siblings, not so much. Right. So, um, with my mom, my grandma will often say like, I, I just don't know where we went wrong or, and I'm like, you, you didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. What happened is she married a monster mm. and, you know, maybe she was predisposed to having addictions. Maybe she chose alcohol as her medicine and mm. Like it's, it's nobody's fault. It's just so many factors leading right. up to it. Um, but yeah, families have a lot of heavy stuff and we forget that too. Mm. And, um, 
Yeah, I don't know what we're talking no, about. No, I don't. But... It, doesn't, <laughs> it's it, all doesn't, it really doesn't matter anymore what we're talking yeah. about specifically. I think you're right, though. And, and that's kind of an interesting message that you say. It's the same thing you say to the kids is like, uh, it's not really your responsibility to do anything for anybody rather other than what you can do for them, right? It's like there, maybe there's nothing that could have been done for your mother by, by your grandmother, yeah. right? Just like there's nothing you can do for some of those kids that walk in other than whatever it is you can do. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is too, it's important to realize, um, especially for anyone in a role like mine is you, you don't have any control over your own life. A hundred percent. Like there are things that are going to happen in your life that you right. have no control over, but you have zero control over another person's life at all. Right. Cause you can't control their actions, their choices, their thoughts, feelings. You can't control what happens around them. You can help to control the interaction you have with them. So in that sense, you, you make an intention that all you're going to be in their life is a positive person. Right. And if that's all you can be, then you've done, you've done your job. Right. And you'll feel it in your gut. You'll feel it. If you know, if you know that you're supposed to be doing more, you'll know. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I know it doesn't really make no, sense to true. people, but you just, you'll know. What's true. Now I often say that like, okay, yeah, the human body is like, it's pretty, it is what it is. It's a pretty old design. You know, we've been, we've, we evolved to this point and we're just working with whatever, but also the intuition that we've developed over millions of years, the intuition, the gut instinct, yeah, that's like almost like magic in some yeah. ways. You, you know, when you're fucking up and you know, when you've done what you can do and you know what you yeah. should do a lot of the time should. Could yeah. Well, that's why you. That's why there's a such thing as a guilty conscience, right? When you mm. know you've done something wrong and it, you feel like you're gonna throw up. <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that's deep. Like it's it's there for a reason, right? right? And I think you know we. It's like our inner compass, and people don't listen to it enough, or they're too yep. busy to even acknowledge well, it. They right? believe that it couldn't even be. Oh, what do um, I know? What do I know? It's got the answers outside of me. Yeah, exactly. But but you're right, and it sounds like you've kind of gone on that journey to be more in tune with yours as well. I'd be interested one day to hear your story. <laughs> oh, well, you listen to all 105 episodes of my podcast, you might get it, but I would never I, sus- I would never subject anyone to that, but I think for me it was well, no, I'm there's no way to simplify it, but I think it, it was through the podcasting and through speaking more and 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 trying to speak on what I f- truly thought without thinking too much about what other people thought. That's where I came to find that I am the frame of reference for my existence, period. I don't listen to much podcasts. I don't watch any TV. I hardly watch the news. I watch like hockey and listen to one ridiculous podcast that I won't name. And it's, but that's all I need. Like I, I don't need the endless stream, you know, because the endless, there's a, there's an eternal endless stream inside me. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And like, there's no, there's no, listen, it's, it's entertaining to listen to points of view. I'm, I think we're on the same wavelength here where I don't like to listen to it unless it's like kind of educational and sure. just will help me develop my own perspective. Like interesting. Like I've never heard that take before and then sit with that. It. it doesn't mean that like I have to completely change my point of view, right? but if it, but if it's like found, I just don't, I don't like listening to stupid. Like I don't do well. <laughs> with um, yeah. So I'm, I think we're very similar in that yeah. way, but you're, you're so right. Like if we could, people are like, I'll be like, Oh, tell me your life story. Oh, I'm so boring. Are you kidding me? Look at you. Like, you're we'll alive. Try again. Yeah. Try yeah, like, you're yeah. Not, What do you mean you're bored? Like you're boring. Do you know what it took for you to be here? Right. <laughs> right. And well, like, even I was like thinking this morning, I was like, I really don't know anything about you. I did a little bit of prep and I was like, well, I got to stop underestimating guests. Like, not that I underestimated you, but it was like, I don't know. I don't really know. Are we going to go down the road of feminism, which we still can, but it doesn't interest me because, and then once you started sharing, it's like, there's a whole eternity inside. There's a universe in each of us. That's yes. wild. Yeah. It's crazy. And listen, as for the feminism stuff, do I believe in equality? Yeah, I do. But like, we don't need to talk about that. There's enough people talking about that. Thank you. Like, I believe that every human being should be treated equal. Done. There's my point of view. Yeah, I have a, yeah exactly. <laughs> right? yeah. You could put yeah, any... Like, I'm part- I'm more interested in what's happening individually in all of us and what is our collective purpose? Why are we all here? Why did we choose to be here during COVID? Why did all the people who were kind of in their prime during the world wars, why were they around at that point in life? Like what has been our mission? What is our, cause I do believe, you know, like this sounds Scientology, which is crazy, but like, this is not Scientology. Here we go. Um, here we go. 
No, no, no. <laughs> no. Um, I do I do believe that we are each here with a purpose, but then I also believe that together with each of our individual purposes, we're part of a, like a huge community working towards one big thing. And I don't believe, um, what was I just going to say? Oh, I don't believe it's a coincidence that we are all here right now when we're here. Okay. Um, I have had a lot of clients come to me or even just a lot of people on social media randomly comment or send me uh, private messages being like, you know, I very recently started diving into spirituality or diving into my purpose. I don't think it's a coincidence that we were all forced to essentially shut down for two years and regroup right. and reset and reprioritize and take a step back and, and be forced to slow down and take a look at our lives. Yeah. Right. Cause a lot, and, and that drove a lot of people nuts, especially for me. I'm cause they had to go within. Cause they, they had to listen. I'm totally fine sitting within and I'm totally fine. I'm an introvert by, by heart. Like I'm totally introverted. Right. Um, and I was fine <laughs> isolating. <laughs> that was great. The bathroom was clean. The, yeah. the like kitchen I didn't was love clean. not, I did not like not seeing my family. Well, Don't get me wrong about that. That sucked, but I didn't mind not having obligations and plans and I was okay. Just figuring out how to make our, my little, my life better and yeah. the lives of my children. And how can we be more of a cohort and what can we do to make the world a better place? Now for people who are not comfortable sitting with themselves, that's when a lot of mental disorder, mental health disorders came in and a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression. And because then they were forced to stop being so busy and distracted. Right. And to then hone in on what was going on, which a lot of times wasn't pretty. Right? Well, it wasn't. It, no. Right. But it not, it never is, but some people are more further along or more accepting or more like we can accept what we are inside. Whereas if you've, if you've never looked and then one day you have to look, it could be horrific. It could be bad and the outcome could be really bad. And so uh, my heart goes out to any families who lost people during this, um, whether due to, you know, COVID itself yeah. or due to skyrocketing rates of suicide or, right? Because Drug I overdose. think for a lot of, yeah, overdoses, like there's, there's so many things that came from this. Um, and I, you know, not all of it was due to people looking inward and like having to face the ugliness head on. But I think a lot of it was if, I don't have stats, <laughs> but if I was a betting woman, I think that's a lot of what happened. And it's, it really hurts my heart for the families. Yep. Um, but unfortunately with any big thing in the world, there will be people who thrive and people who, who aren't able to. Well, that's, that's just the way yeah. life is truly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, I mean, not to just to zip over and say the U S has been dropping bombs in Yemen forever. And now, but now we're seeing a war in the Ukraine where, so suddenly the attention shifts over there, but it's like life has been a bloody, horrible massacre since day yeah. one. So let's just, yeah. it's not your pain to take on, I would say for me anyway, but. Oh, I, and I, I agree with that. Like, I think, um, we, okay. So going back to the savior complex. So, you know, you watch the news, you watch these horrific things going on and on that level, like I'm not that naive i can't do anything about it i personally Brittany contessa cannot stop russia from bombing ukraine <laughs> like i i can't would i if i could if i was a freaking superhero that could fly and <laughs> sure. actually do that like in the movies hands down i would right without a doubt that would, you know and there are a lot of really good people who wish that they could do that yeah i think on a local perspective you say okay I can't do that, but what can I do to make the world a better place? I can't make the war in Ukraine go away because that's, that's a whole other specimen, but what can I do closer to home that can be like anti-war? <laughs> well, you promote peace. You give people kindness. You give people love. You say hello at the grocery store. Yeah. You, you know, make a funny face at a child to make them laugh. You just try to <laughs> spread goodness. And that's sometimes all we can do at a more local level, yeah. right? Like, I'm not a dictator. I have no power over anything. These other people do. Right. <laughs> so, well, like, you know. yeah, well said. I couldn't agree more. I think you have to, I had a guest on who said you have to turn, you turn around your life and that's how you turn around the world. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. That's powerful. I think yeah. Michael Jackson said that too in man in the mirror, but oh. Michael, <laughs> Michael was onto some stuff. He said, take a look, you know, if, yeah. 
I don't remember. I'm not going to sing, but that's one of my no. favorite songs. <laughs> hey, I love Michael. Uh, anyway, I man, there's. I wanted to go back to when you were talking about uh, being forced to sort of insulate or or quarantine or whatever during the the pandemic and and looked inside. You looked inside. So so did I. I did a lot of self work, as they call it. I was talking to somebody yesterday. They suggested that the existential crisis that was brought on by COVID was so impossible to imagine, right? Like it really, we can't imagine what that was. It was a global event. And so some people, because they couldn't compute it, they, they became hateful. And I met some people at a political rally. I shoot news for a living and we were at a political rally. And these people were angry at me for being a news person. They weren't angry at me. No. You know? They, they weren't angry at you as a person. They don't know you. They don't know anything about you. It's what you represented, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's what I represented. And, but so much of that self-loathing and a real existential dread of my life could change like that because of something I can't control. It was almost a religious, it's a religious, yeah. you know, what's the word? Pagan fear of the unknown that has yeah. to come out somehow. Yeah. If you haven't mastered yourself, you don't have a hope in hell. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. The hate that, listen there, I've seen a lot of miracles come out of this. A lot of, a right. lot of things. Well, like not that this is a miracle, but even like Fem Powered was, was born with the pandemic. Like it, the idea came around before, but it didn't truly happen until mm -hmm. COVID. And like, listen, my brother passed away three weeks into COVID. So there was, we couldn't have a proper funeral. We couldn't mm. do Like I had to say goodbye to him by myself with a rubber glove and a mask and a gown. And I couldn't even feel his skin, like nothing like it by myself. And so I look at that whole situation and then having to having to grieve. And at first, before they even said like he was, he had lost brain activity. I could only talk to him over the phone. So they put a phone next to his body who was on life support. And I had to just talk to him like that mm. and from my basement by myself. That is traumatic in itself. And that was only my story. I don't know everybody else's stories of what happened with right. this. Um, but I think the fact of that is on an individual level, I took this entire thing and I made it into something I think quite beautiful. And a lot of other people have done the same thing. Yes. And I'm so happy that there, that has come out of it besides just the hatred, because a lot of what we see is the hatred. And I'm glad that you're doing what you do, because I think that you also are taking people who are trying to make a, a good difference in the world. And we're not seen. We're not seen because we're not Kardashians. <laughs> we're not, right? Like, Well, no. And those people are the problem, frankly. Those people are demons. I really believe that. Yeah. It's... I, I don't pretend to know the inner workings of them, but I, the, yeah, media is a whole other thing and Hollywood is a whole other thing as well, right? I, I do believe that. Yeah. Well, I do believe that. But then people that are trying to create change, real change, lasting change, um, you know, we're not the ones with 10 million plus followers on social media and because it doesn't draw in money and it doesn't, but it's the sad truth. <laughs> it's the sad truth. And I will just backtrack quickly and say they're not literal demons, but what, they are a product of a demonic culture, yes. I would say. Yes, that's right. And that's the thing too, is they get judged as well. And so when I'm like, I find myself like starting to judge, I'm like, whoa, 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 step back. They were born into the world as well as babies. Let's take a look at what their lives mm -hmm. were like and how they got to this spot where they were. They could have very easily ended up homeless if their situation was different it's or true. right. Like, yeah. So it's, it's, we're very quick to judge each other, but then we, we have to just recognize that we are all born into such crazy different situations mm -hmm. and we're okay. supposed to be, but I read this thing one time and it really like, it sat with me and it was like, the garbage man is just as important as the surgeon. Hmm. And I was like, yes. <laughs> well, right. Because there's that interconnectedness of everything. Yes. And it's like, yeah, but in society, we don't see it that way. But on an individual, like more spiritual level, that is how it is. You are just as important as I am, gotcha. just as important as my kid. Um, and the beggar on the street, right? Like there's no, once you recognize that, I think judgment kind of just floats away. Floats away. <laughs> I would take it a step further and you tell me, I would say the garbage man is the surgeon. I would say that those two guys are me and those three of us are you. Like we're actually all of the same cloth. You know what I mean? 
Well, we absolutely are of the same cloth and it's just the opportunities we've been given. Right. Heck, I could be a millionaire too if I was <laughs> if I was thrust into that situation. Sure. And it's the same as like, you know, you read stories. I've been kind of going into stories of uh, like doing a little bit more research and whatnot on, you know, um, like Black Lives Matter movement and just different things like mm-hmm. all sorts of social, social change platforms. Um, and one that stuck out with me, like one phrase was, um, well, it was like when Kim Kardashian said, like, people are afraid to work these days or whatever she said. It was oh. she's something stupid. Like people don't, people are afraid to work I don't know about these that. days. Um, the opportunities that I'm given because of the color of my skin are way different than the opportunities that say a black woman are given. We could work the exact same, the exact, like, but mm-hmm. our situations are, are, unfortunately, our skin color is different and we need to be in a society that hopefully moves away from that, but right. because of racism, et cetera, our, our outcomes in life will probably be completely different. And how is that fair? It's not, it's not. It's not. And, um, that's yeah, that's another conversation that gets me heated. I, wow. I wish it wasn't that way. I don't. But I think it's funny because to rage against that is in some sense, in some ways futile because we as a I mean, maybe there's a better day down the road. I'm not I, I saying, pray there is. I pray it's right. But also let's look at how human beings operate is we have to form biases. We have to make it. I'm not arguing for racism here, by the way, but no, I'm no, just no. I'm just saying what I mean to, to, to get away from the things that are so foundational would be to get away from being human. And that, that day may come too. Yeah. I hear you. I hear it. I know there's so many things right now. I just wish weren't. And I, so again, it goes back to, okay, what can I do? What can I do to, there you go. to change this? And you know, I'm the, the mission of Fem Powered. I can feel it slowly shifting cool. bit by bit. Um, you know, so the client work will continue, but I can feel it kind of shifting towards not just like, Oh, equality. It's like true equality. Like how can I, how can I work to create better lives for women who, because who they were born to, or the the race they were born to, how can I create equal opportunities for them? Because Mm -hmm. I truly, truly to the base of my heart, believe that we are the same. Yeah. We are the same. And I like, I think, especially lately for a lot of us, we've been looking at racism and things like that. And um, it is so based on hatred that I can't quite wrap my head around it. <laughs> like it actually makes me feel sick. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. so complicated. I can't even get my thoughts together for sure. it right now, but I can feel, I can feel from power shifting and I need to figure out how to, how to create some balance of some kind for, for not just, you know, women who look like me all women or anyone who identifies as a woman for that matter. Sure. Like how, how can we make, create this change? So this is, yeah. Let me ask you. Yeah. Well, that's a hell of a mission by the way. So good luck. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's big and it's, yeah, it's a big shift and I don't know how it's going to happen, but this is something that I'm going to be pondering for the next little bit. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you, I like what you say about equality of opportunity because that, that's a tough one to parse. Right. But it's like, you should at least, I don't know how a hell you would ever do that, but on what, uh, but I think it would have to be what you're saying. What we've been saying is like on that one-to-one level is like, what, what function would there be to you going to a black indigenous, whoever Filipino woman and saying like, don't internalize being lesser than like how much of that is necessary? Like, yes, yes, there are sure there are structural things that are keeping you down. Sure. There are but don't internalize that and don't see yourself as being lesser than like, is, is that a start? Well, listen, internal empowerment for men, for women, for any human being, it's never a bad thing right. ever. Right. Because once you build people up enough, you give them that courage and that strength to take that first step and say, no, I am enough. I am right. more than enough. And I'm going to, I'm going to get somewhere. Okay. Right. Despite what society has told me, I'm going to, just completely defy it. Right. But it's pretty hard to take that first step when you're like, well, I'm not as good as fill in the blank, right? Sure. The white chick down the street. It's exactly. Right. And and that's the thing too. Like I I know um I know black women, I know Filipino women, I know women of every race, and they are all equally as incredible. And I see that. Right. But it's pretty easy for me to see that because racially I've had it pretty easy. Mm. <laughs> Sure. 
I will say that right off the bat. And I, it's like, it's like that white privilege. Right. And again, white privilege and people not knowing that I'm actually indigenous. Um, <laughs> right. People don't care the actual story. They just care what you look like. That That's is the truth. <laughs> definitely true. Definitely true. Yeah. I just wonder so, if the dividing lines that, that we create, that's the problem, right? Like, how do we get to a place where it's like, yeah, you have to, you have to embrace your race and your cultural traditions, but you maybe can't make your identity that, or you, or you can't put that first. Like I'm a black woman. That's great. But if you internalize that as being somehow lesser than somehow different, then you're going to go through life believing that the whole thing's a fight. Yeah, I see what, I see what you're saying. I'm just and spitballing I, by the way. I don't No, No, And to an extent, I agree. I agree. On the other hand, I want everybody, I want everybody to be proud of exactly who they are. But I think when we start labeling ourselves as well, it gets tough. So like you right. said, you know, um, you know, for a black woman to say, I am a black woman. Yeah, that's factual. You are a woman and you are black. You're correct. And I am a white woman. But at the end of the day, I am a human. Mm. And I think if everybody, and listen, society, society again, has bred that, that I wish that wasn't a thing. I wish all of us could just be proud of who we are with no bars, right? That's just how it is. We are human beings and we're, we're just proud to be who we are. Society has not been kind to many, many people. Um, I wish we could get to that point. And I think there are a lot of people who are um, in a quiet space actually doing just that. We don't know about them. Sure. They're working to create these changes. And I hope in my lifetime, I see it because I want everybody to be able to express their culture and express how they were raised and shared different parts of the world with each other without feeling embarrassed to do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I know, it's... I and I don't have the answer. I don't know how oh. that's going to happen. So. But I'll I think keep what I'm doing. <laughs> that is the answer is just to be you. I think I, I don't, I don't think there's anything beyond that's to me has been the process is like, there's nothing I can do that I can't do. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing I can yeah. do. I can only yeah. do me. And, yeah, ex- no, and, and right. that's that's just it. That's just it. So yeah, I it's it's all very complicated. <laughs> it is, it is. But you <laughs> at the end of the day, it's just complicated. And I wish everyone just loved each other. I know that sounds so naive and like out there, but I, it would just be nice for a change. Sure would be. Sure would be. Now I think how are you for time? Do you got 10 more minutes for me? Yeah, yeah I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I, I think that so many of the forces at play, whether it's media, politics, there's obviously some kind of dark forces at play that that pull us apart, right? Because what you're saying is if we all loved each other and we all united, we'd be impossible to stop. But also there'd be nothing to do really. But I, there's we, there would be no challenge, would there? <laughs> well, so that's it. There has to I mean, we're bred to look for challenges. We've evolved to to look for for challenges. We're also, like I said, bred to make in groups and out groups. I just, to get away from that, I think maybe, okay, so maybe you were talking about like the COVID renaissance, truly, of all these people that went and enlightened themselves and started a personal project. I think that would be it. You'd need that on a global scale. But then there's nations that could never imagine having the resources to do that. So then that's another. Well, and that's, that's the thing. So in North America we live in a part of the world where it's a luxury to be able to focus on our mental health and to be fo- and to focus on our business endeavors and to focus on how can we make things better where in other parts of the world they are literally surviving each day right. and if they make it through from the sun to the moon it's like i made it through another day yeah right so i i read a thing one time and it said like it's going to be up to us on this side of the world to get our shit together to help everybody else it it That's really, right. I believe that. I believe that. Um, like, why are why are some countries, you know, like we're not, we don't choose where we're born. Like, uh, well, to some extent, I think we do. That's another story. Um, but like, you know, the the woman who's born in, I don't want to say, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to pick on a specific country. I'll just say a country where women don't have any rights. Okay. As opposed to me, I'm born here, so I do have lots of rights. Right why why is her life worth less than mine it's not right that happens to be where she was born and the hand that she was dealt right you know she may not be able to get out of that situation by herself or make things better so it's going to be up to us 
who, you know, the people who have opportunities and we have the resources, it's like, it's like the universe is like, here's the resources I'm testing you. What are you going to do with them? Mm, yeah. <laughs> are you going to only help yourself sure. or are you going to try to help others? Right. I do believe that's part of like that's, this bigger picture. I don't know how that's yet. Pretty wild, but, but you're on the road. Do you see that? I, I, I do. And I don't know if it's right. I, I'm not saying I'm all knowing, but this is a thought that has crossed my mind is okay. We are given all this. And in the other half of the world, minus like Europe, they don't ha- there's so many countries that don't have that. Mm-hmm. Why, why, why was it that way? Well, that goes on. That's history. That's colonialism. That's a whole whack of things. Yeah. But why was that? <laughs> and it keeps going on and on and on. Right. And so to come back just to the present, it's like, okay, well, I could go through history thousands of years we're not going to do that because i don't have time where am i where am i right now and what can i do with it yeah and i still don't know that yet (laughs) but but like you said just you be you and like yeah trying to spread good instead of bad. the fact that you're even asking the question is is a good thing but you're right it's a luxury to even be able to sit there and say how can i help today you know how can i help versus i have to burn dung to heat my hut and go harvest yeah, I have I to I, go find food. If right. I don't find water today, I will die, and my child as well. Like, what a what a luxury we live in, and I will I will be the first to see that. And I hope that if you have any people who do who do listen and they live in and you know like third world countries or any any countries that just don't have what we have, I hope they know that I fully acknowledge that I was just born into this, and and I don't take it for granted at all. Right, not at all. It's a privilege. And I, yeah, well, it is, I don't know if I have any third world listeners. Who knows? Maybe someday, I guess to me, I think on one part of it is like to get those third world countries, at least to a place where maybe things could improve would be to get them where they're pro- using fossil fuels or whatever, to get them out of poverty with anyway, I don't want to go down. I the, want them to be able to live. Well, exactly. I, but, you know, like what is like, what is surviving? I've listen, I've never been in a place where I've truly just been surviving. You know, we make a joke, especially in the pandemic. And this has been a thing amongst parents of the pandemic because raising kids during this has been impossible. Hmm. We've done it, but it's been (laughs) extremely hard. And so it's like, well, how are you today? Oh, I'm surviving. No, that's just like something you just quickly say it and you have a, a chuckle and you move on with your day, but it's not something to take lightly. Like we're, we're not just surviving, you know, we like, we hit a pandemic where people lost their jobs and, you know, I'm not going to make this political, but we live in a country where, you know, the leader started giving out money and people will have their own opinions about that, but that money kept food on the table and kept children's bellies full of food. Right. Right. So say what you will about that, but there are people where the pandemic hit and it was like, okay, well, I've lost my job and that's that now I could actually die. (laughs) Like that, that, that was the reality for a lot of people in a lot of countries. Right. So I think that's another thing where I get really, uh, I get super heated and bent out of shape when I hear people complaining about certain things. Oh, fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) Like we don't, and myself included, we don't know survival. We have government supports. We have, places to go we can walk into a hotel and sit in the lobby to get warm we can like there are shelters for food there's listen there's never going to be enough of that to go around no but it's there yeah and you're right about that it's a luxury to even be able to think about let alone to have it but i was thinking too is like when we talk about the third world and these people that are just surviving it's like that's kind of a first world savior sort of impression of what's going on exactly. there. Like, some of those people are probably perfectly happy. And what, even saying some of those people, it's like humanity globally. It, I mean, it's a wreck left to right. It's a wreck across the board, but yeah. you know, it can't be, it's not just good here and hell over there either. No, listen. And you know what? It's funny you bring that up. I fully, I fully agree with that. I read a story one time. I can't remember where it was based out of, but it was a poor country. Um, And it was a family, you know, they were living in a very small like hut, essentially. And they were explaining and it was obviously translated, but they were just explaining how, yeah, like things are, things are not easy, but they're happy. Right. And in a lot of ways, I look at that and I think possibly because they have their priorities straight. They know what's important. True. 
right? They know that what's important is not having a brand new vehicle and having a mm-hmm. big house. Right, have, right. They have each other. And if on a day where they wake up and they have a nice meal to share breakfast as a family, and then they can, you know, listen, I haven't been to too many countries, so I don't know what they do, but live, live a day, enjoy pure joy, just, you know, doing what they have to do to make sure they're fed and whatnot, but then just enjoying each other and their values and their morals without being blinded by all these shiny things. And well, that's right. Hollywood and, you know, just all sorts of things and money, right. Cause money is like, I do believe it's the root of all evil. You can do a lot of good with it, but it causes a lot of problems. Um, well, yeah. you're right I, I think there are people that are perfectly happy I think my thing is I don't want anybody to have to struggle no. if you want to live with less and be happy that's perfectly fine I think a lot of us even here listen we have a lot still but a lot of us I think too have purged a lot of things and been like I don't need this and I don't need this and when we get to the bottom of it there isn't actually a lot that we need um but obviously that's on like a North American scale, right? We got rid of a lot, but it's, we still have a lot more than, than a lot of people. For sure. I think a lot of us did realize what's actually important and it's not, it's not like competing with your neighbor. That's for sure. Well, exactly. I would press you a little bit here because you're saying, I just wish people didn't have to struggle. It's like, surely you realize that's an impossibility, right? Of course. But like that root that, that exists within you that that desire exists within you. You can't, so you have to grapple with that, right? Yep. It's every day, every day of my life. I, again, not to sound like a broken record, I'm a mother. And so I look at people, I, you know, I look at Ukraine. I had to stop watching anything to do with Ukraine because anything where there were, where there was children involved, I, my heart couldn't take it. It actually physically hurt. And I, you know, people say, oh, boo hoo. No, I, I could like it hurt. So I shut it off. And, mm-hmm. it, and it's not that I was burying my head in the sand. I know these things are happening. But in order to manage my day to day, taking care of my kids here in the safety of my home, right. I had to not watch that. Um, and I think, yeah, like people will always struggle. I don't believe there will ever be a time where there's not some type of war or hunger or I, I don't I'm not naive enough to believe that. Right. But I think as long as our intent is always to try to end that, then we're doing good things. I don't believe that it's ever going to end, but I think we should always run with the hope that it might. Because oh. otherwise we would just give up altogether. I'm right. not doing anything good for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Unfortunately, a lot of that came out in hatred through, especially out, you know, throughout COVID. They're like, oh, yes. well, this is the world and it sucks and it's never going to get any better. So I'm just going to give up and be a shitty person because who cares? <laughs> Well, yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's totally true. It's funny what you're saying is like, it's in some ways, it's a very almost Christian uh, worldview that like, we could get to a better day. We could get to not utopia, but the possibility of heaven is possible. Heaven exists somehow. I'm not, Mm -hmm. I'm not judging you or saying it's wrong. I think it's great. So to operate in the way that heaven is possible, if I was just if I was just working hard enough at being myself, that to me, that's what it is. That's where I would shut this podcast off and stop talking. That's what it is. Heaven is possible if you just be you, you know? Yeah. yeah I don't think there will ever be a heaven on earth. <laughs> I, maybe that sounds negative or whatever. I, I think that, yeah, like I said, there's always going to be bad things. Um, but the bad, it's like that war between good and evil, Right. right. The if the bad is there, the good is always going to try to come out. For sure, and and how could you know what was good or or great? You have you... no, you've had no frame of reference, <laughs> right? Right. So you just, I guess, yeah. it's noble then what you're doing. I'll say then just to stop to help these kids not get buried in that, you know, and at least put in their mind that there is a better day. Yeah, there's a better day, and how can I help you to have? the best footprint possible in your time on earth. Even if I'm only working with you for a year, if I'm working with you for a week, how can I help you to take that step forward to help others? Because we have, we have to do it. We can't work against each other anymore. We have to work with each other. We absolutely have to, otherwise nothing's going to work. So how can I do that for you? And that's what Fempowered is all about. (laughs) Wonderful. Thank you for wrapping up the episode, Brittany. It was, it was great talking to you. It went, 
I mean, better than I, well, what I went great. How about that? It, went, it was yeah, really it, refreshing. That's not to have any expectations. For sure. <laughs> exactly. That's how I run my whole life. I don't expect anything. And then, so again, Fem Powered is the, is the brand, is the business Fem Powered Yeg on Instagram. Is there any other uh, things we should know about? Any events or anything coming up? Nothing coming up um, in the next little while. As I said, um, the mission and the vision is shifting slightly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in a transition phase right now. Um, so I'll be updating on that once it happens okay. within the next few weeks. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm in idea mode right now. So nice. I, have, I have to sit with that for a bit and see what I want that to look like and how I can even make some things happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm always happy for people to reach out and ask me questions and see how I can help. Absolutely. And definitely give Brittany a follow on Instagram. I, I like the content. It's, it's, it's uplifting. It's also well-made. So it's pleasing to the eyes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, are you, is that your stuff behind you there? You shred? I literally get asked this every time oh, I'm, on, I'm on any Zoom call. No, it's my husband's. He, oh. He's, yeah, he's the musician. Nice. I'm not that cool. I am a bookworm. Right. You married a rock star, huh? <laughs> He wishes. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I think no, like I think in like he's very good. He's awesome. very good. But yeah. Does he have a page or he's just like a hobbyist? No, he does not have a page. He good for him. despises social media. Oh, he's, I love this guy already. Yeah, he he's the observer. He does not partake in social media. He just observes. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope he observes this because he's a very, he's he a will. lucky guy to put up with, not to put up with you, but to get to talk to you every day. <laughs> lucky him. Yeah, we're, we're a good team. We certainly nice. balance each other out. All right. Well, I'll let you get back to your parenting and your balancing and everything. Thank you so much, <laughs> Brittany, for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for watching this episode of the North Bank Media Podcast. Please like and subscribe below and give this episode a thumbs up. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at North Bank Media Podcast for highlights from past conversations and be notified of upcoming episodes. Mm -hmm.